But right now, it's all about DX. And uh, our speakers tonight are, are going to tell us about it. Uh, we have, we're going to start with Wes Lamboli. And uh, Wes, he gave me this little thing to uh, give. And uh, I'll see if I can make justice of it. He, anyway, Wes was invited to a field day by a high school buddy back in 1954. The rest is history. That field day led to a career in electrical and systems engineering, and of course, a lifelong joy of being part of ham radio. Wes has been a team member of eight major de expeditions that have gone to the six most wanted entities and has the honor, to, honor of having five de expedition of the year plaques hanging on his shack wall. He was also part of setting two world records for the number of QSOs on an expedition. Wes does not state that this qualifies him to talk about DX, as he's a humble man, but he does like to brag. And uh, we'd love to hear Wes do some bragging and tell us all about it. You'll be followed up by Nathan Wood, who I will let Wes introduce when the time comes. Nathan is recently back from Svalbard. He's going to tell us, both of these guys can tell us what it's like on either side of the expedition. Thank you, Wes, and here you go. All yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And can I have the slide clicker? Ah. It's great to see everybody here. I'm, even after you heard I was gonna speak, you came anyway, I guess. This is the biggest crowd we've had for quite a while. Uh, I like to be known as uh, Whiskey Three, Whiskey Lemur instead of Whiskey Lima. And let's see if I can figure this out. What do you click here anyway? Oh, this was on one of my expeditions and uh, I was walking down this path, minding my own business and this lemur jumped on my shoulder. I think he was after the banana. But uh, a lot of experiences you can get only on an expedition like some of the things I've been on. So this, this presentation is pretty much a DX from the DX Southeastern DX Club. How many are members here for the? So there's a lot of lot of members in both clubs. So if you want to get into really getting D DX, why uh, you want to join a club just like you did here? Yes. Yeah. How's that? Should I start over? Let me. Let me <laughs> don't, don't start. <laughs> okay. Anyway, how do you get started in DXing? Well, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about what it is and how to do it and where you do it and how to operate and how do you get confirmations. I, I kind of look at um, ham radio, a lot, of, a lot of it's like collecting stamps. Only we collect QSL cards from different places, different people we talk with. So what is DX? Well, you can start by saying it's a long distance or short distance or whatever you want to make it. And it could be another country or something that's rare. It could be around the block on certain frequencies. It's whatever you want it to be. And you can call it, uh, you can call it whatever you want. The main thing is uh, you can do HF, you can do VHF, UHF, all different frequencies, any mode. But the main thing to realize is DX just is. And you can do whatever you want to with it. The main thing is to have fun doing it. It's kind of like a magic carpet to wherever you want to go to somewhere else to talk to somebody. So what is a DX entity? Oh, uh, how many of you had a chance to look at the cards, QSL cards over here before you, when you came in? I want to make, uh, urge all of you to look at that. These are a collection from many years, 1977, and got started with Neil Foster. Raise your hand, Neil. And Neil has Gobs and gobs. It's just a beautiful, beautiful display he has there. Neil's worked uh, 347 entities, and he's on the honor roll, uh, which is an, another lifetime achievement, and he's got eight band DXCC. This, this is a guy that really knows what's going on. So he's put a lot of work into that. But an entity is basically, it's either geographical or political. Eh? It's defined by the DX Advisory Committee. They figure out what it is and they put out a list then. And these are the things you try to hunt for if you're really into DX. 
There's a device called uh, DXCC, DX Century Club, that's an ARRL, uh, keeps track of it. And you get your first award by working 100 countries. And then you can submit for more, and there's presently there's 340 different entities. There's been up to, up to 400, but 60 of them have been deleted for various reasons. Countries get taken over or deleted for various reasons or another. But Neil's got a, almost them, all of them. Right here is the top 10 of the, these entities, and you can look at them, and there are a lot of them are really far away places. I've been fortunate to be to, be to uh, six of these places that aren't on the list anymore, but uh, they were at one time. Uh, a lot of my experience has been in the South Indian Ocean and the South Atlantic near, near the uh, Antarctica. So why do you do DX? I'd like to ask Neil that question. <laughs> why does anybody do it? Well, it's a fun, it's an adventure, it's a challenge, and there's some goodwill associated with it too. When you talk to somebody in another country, you're kind of international kind of a, a hip friendship that develops. There's other things that you want to get acquainted with too, like technology, new friends, uh, and there's a whole gob of things, but mostly down there at the bottom of the right, because it's genetic. We all look for challenges, we're all looking for different ways to have fun, and uh, it's kind of a genetic thing, go on the hunt and try to get a new, new country. It's a lot of fun. And by fun, these are some of the cards that can be called fun. Neil's got a bunch of cards like this. I urge you all to take a look before you leave at some of his cards and what, what they mean, commemorating special events in this case. Uh, my friend here, Bill Parasex, uh, he gave me this presentation back in 2001, I think it was. He did such a great job on it. I asked him if we could use it for our club. And he said, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want. But Bill uh, likes to go on what he calls lazy man expeditions. He'll go down to the Caribbean and just lay back and enjoy the sun and the fun. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I showed you earlier, that uh, picture of the lemur uh, we got when I was on the Comoros D-68C, and we uh, made 168,000 cues from that. I set a new world record. That's where the lemur lived in, in uh, the Comoros. And uh, this is one of the, my near-death experiences when I went to South Sandwich Islands. I can tell you long stories about that, but um, anyway, this reminds me of another story. Does anybody know how to th think the unthinkable? Anybody? How, do, how would you think the unthinkable? Well, with an iceberg. That's what this reminded me of. It'll take a while. You'll, catch, you'll think about it, and Steve got it, I think. But, uh, you know, the Titanic was unthink unthinkable. I mean, I'm, I'm never like On to the next slide. A lot of goodwill goes on, too, with hams, spread goodwill all over the world. And some of these guys are, like in the uh, World Food Program, uh, I know these guys have been on expeditions with them, and they'll go to a country that... Uh, is in need of the services, and while they're there, they'll get on ham radio and make, make contacts. Well, how do you DX? If you're just a shortwave listener, you know, all you need is a receiver and an antenna, but if you want to make a real two-way contact, you need a license. You need to be a ham, and then you can dig into it as far as you want to. You've got to know a little bit about propagation and build up your antennas and more power and more things you get involved with, the harder you want to try to, to try to do better, you got to learn more. You know, like I just said, you need to join a club. A lot of guys in the club will help you. And there's newsletters and all sorts of information on the internet, including the DX cluster, which tells you who's on the air and what frequencies. And this is a good thing to have on your computer. And one of the things you need to know a little bit about is propagation. It's the most significant factor in working long distances it's really out of our control. It's all down to the sun and sunspots. The more sunspots, why the better the propagation is going to be because of the ionosphere is ionized by the aspects of the sun. And at nighttime, on the left-hand side there, the low bands are 
more prevalent. You can go long distances there. You know about AM broadcast and how you can only pick up local stations with AM, which is down in broadcast band, is one megahertz sort of thing. But at nighttime, you can hear countries or hear stations from all over the world, all over the country anyway, because that layer, the D layer, has gone away. Other ionized layer up higher, let the, let the uh, signals go further. The other thing that's going on right now is sunspot cycles about every 11 years, and we're coming up on a big peak now. And I urge all of you, even if you've only got a technician license, get on 10 meters, and you'll be able to work all over the world. It's amazing what's going on right now, and it reminded me, when we were on the Comoros, it was the peak of a sunspot cycle, and I actually worked a guy from the Comoros downtown San Francisco with a handheld walkie-talkie on 10 meters. So it, it can be done. It's just amazing. When the bands are good, uh, sun solar flux index needs to be high, and uh, the magnetic aspects need to be low, and then the magnetic, uh, the maximum usable frequency, the way you go about it is all those factors are there, and then you want to be just above the operating frequency for the you want to be below that for the maximum uh, bet. But with FT8, you never know. You, you might get a contact anyway. Uh, FT8 has really revolutionized ham radio. Whoops. Uh, that's a picture of the um, uh, maximum usable frequencies. And then the, the gray line is kind of that U-shaped thing there where you get what's called ducting at the lower frequencies like 160 and 80 meters if you're in that path why there's a good chance you can work somebody else around the world on that same uh, on that same uh, portion of the duct or the gray line so there's a lot of things to learn about propagation there's some things you can learn all this stuff's on the internet and thing is if you really get into it big time you're taking a risk you can have ice storms come along snowstorms and uh, there's an old saying, ham radio, if your antenna didn't come down last winter, it probably wasn't big enough in the first place. There's also lightning strikes and things like that. So there is some risk, but uh, you, can, you can take some of that out with good designs and thinking about uh, it before you get it done. And then the other thing, too, is we're all here to help. If you have a problem, why there's a lot of people who will help you out. So before it's all said and done, if you don't hear anything, well, you want to check why that is. It might be because of sunspot cycles or something like that, or a corona ejection that can wipe everything out. So you go check the numbers, and before it's all said and done, you want to turn your radio on and listen. And you want to listen some more, and, and then some more, and then listen some more. And one of my favorite stories is John, right over here. Stand up, John. <laughs> one of my favorite stories is about John, who did this very thing, listened hard, and... All of a sudden, he hears this guy in Sri Lanka, wasn't it? Sri Lanka, and uh, I never heard any, anybody from Sri Lanka, but John worked them just because he was listening around, and there it was, and he worked them on phone. So anyway, at nighttime, you want to check the highest frequency with signals and work the low bands if you can. Daytime, you work the lowest frequency with signals and work higher if it's, if it's open, and then look for the gray line if you can. Where do you do DX? Well, you can do it anywhere you want to. You can do it on your bicycle. You can do it from your car. It's just wherever you feel comfortable about having some fun, trying to work somebody that you call DX. So listen, listen, listen are the rules. Be courteous. Observe well, what the DX station's doing and, and try to find out where the DX station's actually operating from. A lot of the DX stations tell you that online. Don't call or tune up on the DX, and there's a lot, of, a lot of people do that. There's a lot of courtesy things you can do, and don't try to be a policeman and tell other people where they're going wrong. That's, that just makes more QRM, so to speak. And then when you're operating, uh, you want to check the propagation and wait for the, wait for the peaks and check the beacons. The beacons all over the world tell you what's coming in from where. And you just uh, use standard phonetic, phonetics, except for whiskey lemur and uh, Quaker Oats and things like that. But some QSL tips, get yourself a good card with your picture on it. Write, write a nice note. It doesn't cost very much to send it. Or you don't even have to have cards. You can use Logbook of the World, which 
you don't have to send a card, take a long time. It's almost instantaneous anymore. Everybody is, anybody is on logbook of the world. So it's a lot of fun, educational, exciting, hobby of a lifetime, memorable experiences, many, many friendships. It just is. So it's up to you guys to get involved with it and uh, you'll have a lot of help, but it's a lot of fun and uh, very exciting. And that's uh, about all I've got. This is back to the Southeast DX Club, but um, that's all I've got to say. Is there any, anybody questions? Yeah. That's a question for Neil. For Neil, good. This, this is an ongoing thing with Neil and me. It's not the <laughs> number one is P5, North Korea. Number two is Capo Reef. I just happen to have that one. <laughs> the and only he, he keeps reminding me he has that. <laughs> anyway, my hat's off though to Neil. He's got hundreds more cards than I do. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one you build build a scaffold on the on the rock in the middle of the South China Sea. Yeah. After recent de expeditions, are Bouvet and Mayotte still number two and three? Uh, they're close to it. They're not down very far, but this was a in twenty two, yeah. and uh, the, the updated ones they're down, they're still on the top twenty list. Uh, Bouvet definitely wasn't yeah. as successful as they wanted to be. So, anybody else? Yeah. So when you travel international. <laughs> How does license reciprocity work? Do you need permission in order to operate in a foreign country? Yes. You, uh, in my experience, uh, you don't have to. It's good to get a license where you're, if you're going to be there very long. But if there is reciprocity, reciprocity, all you need to do is sign your call sign in with a slant, whatever country you're in, uh, like uh, W3WL slash GB. But I just went ahead and got a license when I lived over there. Or you can actually get a license, like when I went to Bouvet, or not to, uh, yeah, no. One of them are countries I went to, I'll think of it in a minute, but I just got a license when I got there, or got to get it ahead of time. So uh, that's how I did it. So if you were gonna combine this with the vacation, say you're going to Mexico, or you're going to the Caribbean, would you need to plan that in advance and get a license, or could you just fly in and put the slash and operate. If there's reciprocity, you could do the slash. But if you're going to go, you don't want to try to get your own personal license with their call sign when you get there, because it's going to take some time to find find the field well, the, where you get the, the license in the first place, and it'll take a time to get issued. So it's, a, it's better to try to plan that ahead of time if you can. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, the last question had to do with um, how do you get a license when you're going to a foreign country? Neil has something to say there. Uh, I might make a suggestion. Hold on, Neil. Hold on, Neil. Yeah. Hold on, Neil. Neil. Oh. I might make a suggestion that you uh, look to get a license in a SEPT country. SEPT is an international treaty where you can use a call sign and not have to uh, use a slash so-and-so, which is very common. That's one of the reasons years ago when I was gainfully employed before I retired, uh, I traveled a lot and getting uh, non-resident licenses got to be extremely expensive, uh, anywhere from 15 to $30 for a short period of time. So uh, I took the exam in England, and I have a full license, what was then called an A license, which is equivalent to our extra. And any country that is a signatory 
country or entity to the CEPT, C-E-P-T. Don't ask me to tell you what it stands for, it's French. And I'm not a Francophile. But anyway, uh, the CEP treaty acknowledges the license from any entity or country uh, that is a uh, signing to the treaty. So that's another option, and, and you have a permanent license. So uh, outside of the United States, I can use a British call sign, which I have, which is G0 and BJ. And, uh, but I can't use that, it's against the law to use that in the US, but I could use it anywhere else. So that's a good way to get around the issue of uh, non-resident licenses. Hang on, I got one more question. I'm gonna walk back. Uh, what is your QTH when you have a license like that in a, in a country like that? You just... So, Wes is going to answer that question. Yeah, it's, it's basically wherever you are, or you have to, if you have an actual license from the country, you need to have an address, just like you do here. And like when I'm in a foreign country, uh, might might be a friend, I'll use their address. A lot of people do that for licenses here. If you know somebody that wants to get a U.S. license, just have them use your address. So that's the easy way to do it. That country I was trying to remember, it was Bhutan, A52 or A5, and my license over there was A52 GB for Gus Browning. Everybody, anybody remember Gus Browning? Oh my gosh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> He was a famous uh, worldwide traveler for DX. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. And, uh, operating in the I know about the SEPT countries, and you can go there if they have reciprocals with the United States, and you can use the prefix slash in your call. But when you go, let's say, to France, let's say, for example, or somewhere like that in Europe, a friendlier nation to us, or not as exotic, if you will, you throw a, a bag with a power supply, a radio, and a wire antenna in your suitcase, bringing it over and bringing it back. I know you got to deal with TSA, but is there any customs issues, or do you have to register it, or what do you do in things like that? Do you have any experience with that? That's a real good question, John, and uh, it's one of those things that you better do right before you get there, because a lot of times you'll have to pay a custom duty to get the equipment in, and it's... Um, it, it's uh, sometimes very onerous what it costs you. Uh, other countries won't even let you take equipment in because it's uh, looked at as politically incorrect. You could be doing something against their government, things like that. So that's another thing that is all part of the planning process when you're going on an expedition. Uh, there's a whole lot of things I could talk about on that aspect of it. I've done logistics for some of these expeditions and it ain't easy and <laughs> you better get it right or you're 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 going to be uh, paying a lot of money to under the table a lot of times to just to get things to happen any other questions oh okay scott i'll be real quick i just want to tell you about a story where i went to uh, Turkey. And I was there for a week. I packed my Baofeng. Uh, Turkey is a reciprocal country, so all I had to do was bring along the documents, my license, and the SEP agreement documentation. And I was able to get on repeaters in and around, um, now my brain's gone, the, the city I was in in Turkey. And uh, help me with it. Istanbul, thank you, thank you. When you get old, you lose my memory. All right, so I was in Istanbul, and I actually worked repeaters in Istanbul, and actually was listening to them, listen, 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 heard some folks talking in English. I gave my call sign, uh, TA2 stroke KB4KBS, and I worked a couple of people on their repeaters in Turkey. So, sometimes it is HF. Sometimes you're going to another country that's a SEPT agreement, Throw your Baofeng in your, your luggage, 
and uh, make sure you have your documentation with you, and you can work the people on the repeaters in those countries. Okay, good advice on that. And with that, I'm going to uh, have our next presenter come up. And where are you anyway? Ah, okay. I'm going to introduce him, and I have to put my glasses on, so just a minute. Hey, our next speaker, our next speaker is Nathan Wood. Nathan is a first-generation ham and was initially licensed in 2012. He obtained his extra-class license in 2014. His DX travels thus far have been to a number of countries that you'll hear more about in this presentation. Nathan described himself as a DXer with a side of contesting. He's also won a couple of contests that I'm sure he will tell us about as well. He has been a Georgia State Manager for the 13 Colony Special Event uh, event ever since 2016. Nathan is a native of Atlanta, and he's semi-retired paramedic after 24 years of service. And in his spare time, Nathan is a financial coach for Dave Ramsey and also enjoys woodworking. And he's married with two kids and a 19-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son. So bring it on, Nathan. Nathan's one of my heroes too. He's doing it, doing it right. I got my head. I got You're absolutely too generous. And if there is a DX or a expedition or whatever you want to call it, uh, do you get the clicker out there, Wes? If there is ever um, a person that is that is worthy of giving a presentation like this, it is definitely Wes. He's um, he is he is one of my heroes, and he's been to a lot of places that I can only dream of. So, uh, with that, I definitely want to give him another round of round of applause. So tonight, my my presentation is going to be a little bit different. Um, it's going to include a little bit of overlap, but we'll go through these pretty quick. Um, it just just how I get got into uh, TXing. Uh, a friend of mine from from um, work suggested that I become a uh, amateur radio operator. Thought it would be fun to get on the repeaters, yada yada. So I did, and then I start going home and I start looking at everything that I can online about what this hobby entails, and it was just absolutely massive. So the one thing that I found that I really uh, kind of claimed to it was the travel aspect. And then somebody told me about one of the, the top 10 you know, entities on Club Log. And I start looking down those you know, places, thinking I'm just going to plan a vacation there. Like it's, you know, it's just like a hop, skip, and a jump, and you're going to be able to go there. Well, obviously, that wasn't the case. I got introduced to another friend uh, who was a duty expeditioner. And he gave me the advice of, if you want to DX, if you want to increase your skills, Go to other countries, wear out the Caribbean because it's cheap, and just practice. Whenever you get good, come back and we'll talk. That gave me a pretty good challenge. So, that's, that, that, so that is exactly what I did. Um, so what, this is mainly going to show uh, what, did you do, what the de-expeditions are and how you can improve your skills contacting the expeditions, and also, if you do want to go on, on expeditions, what that would necessarily mean, and maybe give you some tips while you're actually doing that. Um, um, so your options, wide open, wherever in the world you want to go. And it's, it's just a matter of, you know, the cost to get there? Can you can you actually get there? The the political realm is uh, in, is insane to a, to a couple of places where it's virtually off limits. Um, but there are a lot of places that you can go, and so the world is literally your uh, your canvas. So what I would suggest is a lot of people they they do it while 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 they're on vacation. A lot of people say that yeah, I want to go by myself, and uh, you know I want to do things by myself. A lot of people. They, they like to operate from, from you know, cruise ships. So, I mean, the world is, um, you know, definitely your um, opening. Well, so, you, so you guys already talked about getting your licenses and getting like the reciprocity about places that you go. I would highly suggest that you plan, plan, plan. AWRL's got a, a couple of really good links 
um, on their page um, as, as, as far as places, places to go, things to contact. Um, and uh, for that, I have always um, made sure that all my paperwork was, uh, was in line. If I was carrying any equipment, I made sure that um, all of my paperwork was copied and put on top of it to where if I did open things up, it was, it was obviously a good explanation of what that was and what that was for. Um, I've not had any issues. Um, one thing I could also suggest is make friends of, of where you're going. Reach out to some clubs, reach out to some hams, and get their ideas also. And it's also good to have a good contact in case you get into some trouble. Um, you've already got a contact there on the ground and post your stuff on QRZ, post your plans. That saved me once. I was, I was actually going through customs and uh, they were adding up all the stuff, I was going to charge me whatever amount of tax. The guy walked over and was like, well, what is this? I told him, it was like, ham radio. He's like, oh, well, that's interesting. He turned around and walks away. Where are you going? Thought you were going to help me out. He comes back five minutes later. He's like, he's good. He asked me for my, for my call sign. I had posted my plans of going there. I got out. So just make friends, uh, post things on Facebook. I'm oh, sorry, not Facebook, QRZ. Um, weight size, I'm not gonna really spend a whole lot of time on this because this all just depends on what you wanna actually do. Um, the one thing that I would caution is if you wanna fly with batteries, um, they are allowed, um, but in co different capacities. Um, it used to be where you could actually um, do 160 watt hours. That has now changed to where uh, most only uh, allow um, 100 watt hours. That's not much of a battery. Um, and so you kind of plan how you want to get your power supply. Um, but like I said, that still depends on you know, what kind of trip that you're going to go on and what you want to actually do. Um, Oh, and, and a lot of that, they said, well, you, you can't take two, two extras with the airline approval. Well, who's going to give you the approval and make sure you get it in writing? You don't want to wind up like this guy. So whenever it comes to actually DXing, um, there is there's definitely a learning curve. Um, and, and learning how to DX, learning what works, learning what doesn't. And the, the one thing that I did is I started looking at YouTube videos and I started reading as much documentation as I could. And these were the, the two things that really I found helpful. Uh, Wayne Mills, uh, never met the guy. He's got some really good stuff in a PDF. It's, it's, it's available on his QRZ page. Um, really good stuff. You definitely tell that he's done a lot of um, uh, countries. He's actually founded the DX University. He's in the CW uh, the DX Hall of Fame in 99. And um, it definitely got some good stuff. If you're more of a YouTube guy, Eric, I don't even know how to pronounce the last name, K6VVA. If you really want to hear 44 minutes of the driest presentation that you've ever thought about, watch this video. And I, but I still recommend it because he's got some really good stuff in it, but he could really make this a 10 minute video. But it goes on for 45 minutes. Um, I'm not going to question the guy. I know that a lot of people know the guy. He's, um, he's an interesting fellow. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. He's got some good stuff on there, and I take the good part. I just kind of leave the bad part away. What I did find is that the pileup techniques, it's more of an art form. Whenever you're managing a pileup, who's heard of a bad pileup? Who's heard, who, who has heard of a pileup completely out of control, people calling out of order, the tuner-uppers, the policeman area, who's heard of a really bad pileup? They're all over the place, okay? And I'm going, to, I'm going to go as far to say that the pileup is a reflection of the operator and their skills. I know it's not 100%, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but, but what I want to be able to share is I want to share you know, what we're trying to do, what you listen for. That way it makes you actually a better operator from the U.S. And whenever you're doing that, and whenever you're trying to manage your own pileup, I want you to think about what annoys you from the state side. Is it somebody that you don't hear a call sign from for, the, for like 10 minutes in a row? And you're wondering, who is this guy? You run across the bass of pileup, they never get their call. They just say QRZ, and you're wondering, who is this guy? Are they working split, or do they need to work split? Um, are they working by the, by the, the numbers? This is the absolute worst. This is just pet peeve of mine. So you know, I'm not saying nobody do it. This is pet peeve of mine. If anybody's working, working by the, the numbers, I'm not waiting for them to come around to a number four so they can get to five guys. That's not me, and then go on again. I'm, I'm, I'm just not doing it. That's, that's just that completely aggravating. Um, be consistent and shorten your exchange to only what is needed. Um, just whatever it is, what makes you spin the dial? And if, and if you know what that is, 
Just don't do it. Just don't do it. And, um, but yes, um, there was actually another author that actually wrote the line that the DX pilot's behavior is a reflection of the skills of the, the, the operator. Now, the, is that going to be 100%? No, because you're going to have pirates, you're going to have lids, you're going to have you know people that have that you, that you just busted their net. Uh, so I uh, know it's not going to be like still 100%. People will get upset for several reasons, um, but it's not always going to be because you know it was it was your skills. And whatever you do, if you plan on getting on 20 meters at night. Don't get on 14, 230 and think that you're going to have a pile up. Does anybody know what 230 is? I hear some chuckles, yes. Because you know what? They, it, it will be a silent frequency and they will let you get on. And they will let you get a decent pile up and they will wait till somebody spots you. They may even spot you themselves before they turn on the SSTV. And now you've got 90 seconds of nothing that you can work around. Whose fault is that? Mine, I go, I don't know. Just don't do it because trust me, they will win. Um, so what I actually brought is I actually brought a, a sample of a decent pileup. And this person, individual, um, I want to let you, I want to let you guys actually see just how well this pileup went, what the operator skills were, how it was handled, and you tell me what you think and see if you learned anything just from listening to this individual. Uh, maybe just a few minutes, we'll actually stop a couple times in between. Uh, but, uh, but you tell me what you think. Hello for Alpha Romeo India. Hello, 8 November Delta. You are 5-9 in the current south. 73, you are Z. Whiskey, Whiskey 5, November X ray. That's correct. You're 5 9 at the Austin, Texas. You are 5 9 in the current south. Thank you, 73. 73. You are Z. Okay. Zero X ray station. Whiskey 1, go on the X ray. Patient Indian and Zulu X-ray. Zulu X-ray, Quebec, Zulu X-ray, over. Whiskey Alpha One, Quebec, Zulu X-ray, you're 5-9 in Curacao. Thank you for the Curacao, you're 5-9 into Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for the contact, 73. Okay, did anybody just pick up on what she just did? She called out the Zulu X-ray station, but there was another um, station that came in right afterwards to X-ray Zulu. What she didn't do is take him, even though she heard his entire call sign, she was consistent because she called back to the first station. Oh, by the way, if you ever want to get a pileup, get a YL in the air, that's what, that's, that, that's what you want to do the pileup, that, and that's what is that. Um, if, if, and if anybody's figured out who this is yet, don't even say it yet. I don't want to say this to them. Um, all right, let's go to the next. I want that echo mic. 
And I want the Roger beat. That was just cool. I like it. Probably 11 meters, but oh well. Um, so on that one, who knows something that she did right? She was giving out her call sign every third contact. So it only took just a couple of minutes to actually hear who this person was and not that you were just listening forever and ever and ever. But yes, I definitely want that Roger B. I can't even say that with straight face. November Golf 5. November Golf 5, uniform, you're 5'9. Five 5'9 nine. Five nine into the Texas Panhandle. The handle here is Woody. Thanks for the contact. You're 5'9 into Curacao. Thank you. Pablo Juliet 2, so Kilo 4, Alpha Romeo India. Cool. Kilo Bravo 9, Alpha Echo. Kilo Bravo 9, Alpha X-ray. Alpha X-ray. Name is Sam, Delta Alpha November, and you're 5-9. Over. Kilo Bravo 9, Alpha X-ray. You are 5-9 in the current south. Roger, you are 5-9. Thank you. Thanks for the contact. You are Z. November 5, Bravo Station. Yeah, November 5, Bravo, Quebec, Juliet. Name is Mike. I'm in Alamogordo, New Mexico, southern New Mexico, right? You're 5 9 to the current south. Okay. You're 5 9 down here also, thanks. Thanks for the contact. So, how'd she do? Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, so you know, it, it wasn't really, uh, really that of a bad, ex especially for her. Well, I'll just say that for the last. Um, what I noticed is, is, is that she was very consistent. She, she gave her call sign out every third contact. Um, and what was really telling about how she did operate is that in the middle, you heard complete silence. Once she, once she called for the, for the contact, there was nobody talking over somebody that she was trying to get back to. It was complete silence, and that stayed that way through the entire um, pilot that she ran for probably a good two hours. Um, she didn't get frustrated. Um, my, I guess, pet peeve about that is that she used a lot of words. Thanks for the contact. In Curacao, you know, throwing things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, it was her pilot. She ran however, however she wants to because, because, because that, was, that, that, was, that was actually hers. Did you notice about where she was hearing the calls from, though? If you were calling her, when would you call? Right after she calls QRZ? Take the end. Five seconds later, no. 10 seconds later, she was catching a lot of ends of the call sign. She was saying call sign ending in November Zulu, call sign ending in. So if I was calling her, I, I would probably wait, maybe, maybe, maybe five seconds and then get my call sign. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so of the uh, A, B, and C system, I guess what kind of grade would you, would, you, would you give her? Who would give her an A? Who would give her a B? Who would give her a C? Y'all just critiqued my wife. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. You I, didn't, well, I didn't have to. <laughs> no, she had literally just flown down to actually meet me down in Curacao. This is her very first pilot whatsoever. Somebody might have been logging for her. Somebody might have been pointing something out for her. But she did a really good job, and, I, and I'm actually very, very proud of it. I checked you you did. So uh, that's just like the um, um, skills. And when people say, listen, 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 what are you listening for? I'm listening to what have I got to do in order to make this co uh, contact with this person. How are they running their file up? Are they being consistent? And if they're being consistent, you're going to be able to figure it out of when to call, who she's calling, and what you have to do in order to modify your skills in order to actually match hers. And that's how you're going to get, going to get into the, the log. Um, other tips if you're going on an expedition edition um, to learn who, you, who, who you're trying to actually contact and what you've got to do in order to get there. Uh, know your band plan, you know, know the, the, um, the different ranges between te technician general and extra. And if you look at the, the, the different, um, my mind's going blank now, the, the different privileges that actually people have in different countries, let's just say 20 meters for instance. Japan can actually go on 20 meters on, one, on 14 110. We can't do that here in the U.S. But if you go to another region where you can operate on 110 and you want to get Japan on, 40, on, on, on 20 meter sideband, you can actually go and you can actually get them. DX window is usually 192 to 200. That's not necessarily, uh, 
it's set in stone, but that's a good range, of, it, just on 20 meters, if you want to work a lot of people in a, in, a, in, in a lot of different countries, just know you're going to be working a lot of people in a lot of different countries at the exact same time and not weeding them out. Um, and just learn, you know, just about your propagation, all that kind of stuff. It's probably not a good idea to be on 80 meters in the exports in the band at lunchtime. It just doesn't work that well. I think I have a picture of um, Wes in, on one of his expeditions. <laughs> in fact, this is Wes. Warren, Katie Ford Z is actually fixing the radio for him. If anybody knows who this guy is, please let me know. And they wanted to actually say some stuff about Field Day as well, but I'll let them talk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. So let me talk a little bit about, about, about the trips that I've actually made and uh, maybe a little bit of what you might be able to uh, get. The very first trip I ever went as far as the, the DX was to Haiti. I was already there with a uh, non-government organization and we were um, working. I was on the ground a little bit earlier, but this was the first time that I actually went after I got licensed. So I packed some stuff in like a small Pelican case. I wanted to be very, very minimalistic. And this is what I actually got across the border and in there. And you can say this was uh, horrible conditions. I wish I had a better view. This is an off-center fed dipole that I put up there in the uh, palm tree. The coax comes, comes down, goes up into like a little platform area, which is where I was sitting. And this was my station. And it literally was just the, the bare base. I didn't even have a computer to log in. I did everything and log. Um, so this is where I started. And trust me, I had no idea what I was doing. The pilots came, and, and it was just like I had absolutely no skills, but it was, you know, it was baptism by fire, and that's exactly what that was. But I learned a lot by falling flat on my face. Granted, I walked away in a week, I think with like 500 contacts, and I was okay with that. Next place was Jamaica, another horrible view. This was July of 2014. We were on vacation there. I literally took almost the exact same stuff. There's your off-center fed. And I, I, I did take a computer this time because I got tired of writing down, actually, you know, blogging everything once I got back. Um, again, we were really rough in it. But this, okay, this was a, this was a really cool uh, trip. Uh, 2016, they had the uh, National Parks on the air. It was a celebration of their 100th anniversary, and they wanted to put all the uh, parks, uh, all of the, the national parks on the air. Uh, we took a trip there. Um, not outside of the U.S. It was it was uh, it was actually a, a it was actually still a part of Florida, but this was a really remote place. You only got there by boat, um, and actually you can actually get there by like a seaplane, but we couldn't transport stuff there, so we went by boat. We camped out for three days. Um, no infrastructure, no electricity, um, no running water, um, and uh, no no internet, no cell phone service, no nothing. Might as well be out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we packed light. Uh, you see the antennas uh, back up there. One uh, challenge that, that we had was uh, our power supplies. We had no places to you know, recharge our batteries. So we had to kind of get creative in the, that. Um, so you see like the, the, uh, the big windmill over there. That was our absolute lifesaver. It helped out greatly. And of course, we were able to supplement with a couple of the solar panels as well. Like I said, we packed light, maybe. I don't know. We were, <laughs> we were limited to 50 pounds each. And nobody even paid attention to it. We just kept piling stuff on the boat. And they just kept taking it. So. Next trip was to uh, Trinidad. Again, roughing it. Really, really, really rough, really rough conditions of there. Um, this was kind of a, um, a last minute trip. I had a friend actually hook me up with a license who was actually already there. He actually went and actually got it for me and uh, was able to actually meet him while I was actually there. Really great guy. Um, and it just, I didn't have a whole lot of time to actually offer it. So I only walked away with, uh, I think, less than 100 contacts. Um, but I did have a lot of power line of noise that really um, uh, made things very, very challenging. And I was also, I know that's not a great picture of the station, but um, like it was, um, that's, just, that's, just, that's just what it was. Your next category, did you know that you can rent stations? That, that you can actually go to other countries and rent stations? A lot of them are contest stations, but you can go to, to different places in that you can rent a ham radio station um, in another country, and this is what we did for a couple of these. 
when I said, or I guess whenever I was introduced as being a DX or with the side of contesting, a lot of these places, a lot of these places that X teams go to, they'll go for the DXing portion, but they also go for like a contest. Contest is only going to be two days. So what we'll go is we'll go and we'll DX the week before and the week after, and then we'll do the, the contest there in the middle, and you kind of get the whole combination of both. So, so the, the, this is kind of what my start was as far as Curacao, um, and that was a trip that I went on with uh, Tim. I think he was on the very first trip with me. Again, very difficult conditions. Obviously, you can tell it was, um, yeah. Modest antennas. Maybe a few wires up in the air. Nothing too, too impressive. And put me by the kitchen and I'm good. We were running like maybe five, five, 500 watts. Everybody had K3s. It was like five or six stations and a plethora of antenna switches that were just absolutely amazing. We had a, we had a really good time there. This was the place that I actually won um, first in the AWRL sideband worldwide um, in the multi-multi category. We were beat worldwide by a multi-two station. They only had two operators. We had eight, but they still beat us. So that's you know, no 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 no, no hard feelings there, right? Um, and then we went back in 2013. We placed fifth in the in, in the entire world, and that was a lot of fun with the uh, CQWPX. Next place, uh, Bon Air. Still another really rough place to go to. I ought to choose better places to go. I was invited to, to, to actually go on with this contest station in March of 2020 in the AWRL sideband contest, one that we lost to the multi two station. It wasn't until I got there and these guys introduced me and kind of welcomed me into the group, hey, we're going to do this contest, yada, 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 that they let me in on the secret that they were the multi two station that beat us in the, in, in the multi multi category. <laughs> And they did not let me forget that for that trip and the two trips after. <laughs> in fact, we just talked about when we actually met um, down in Orlando a couple months ago. Um, again, very, very modest antennas. Just a few. The guy knew what he was doing. He really, really did. And this was basically the operating stations, the four that were right next door to each other. Anybody recognize this guy right here in the front? Adrian. K-O-A-S-C-A. He was actually one of the members of the Bove team that uh, just got back. Really neat kid. It was really fun to work with him. We had an absolute blast. And uh, we need to talk about my Bove contact. That's all I got to say. Uh, but no, no, I mean, just a just, just really great group. But yeah, but, the, but the other two, they were like, yeah, yeah, we, we were the multi-two station that actually beat you guys. So I'm like, yeah. Um, and the next, so my last trip, which was just September and uh, October of last year, um, the goal was for us to go up to Svalbard, which is actually a item of Norway. In order to get there, we, uh, we actually chose to take a little bit of um, detours. And the first uh, stop that we made was at two operators' house here in Sweden. It was really just to meet the operators and their family. Um, so I'm not going to pass up an um, opportunity to ask, can I operate your station? Thank you. So, uh, so we went and, uh, you know, we met a couple, a couple great hams. This was uh, the uh, Hawk, uh, SM5AQD. Um, he let me operate his uh, station. You can see his modest antennas as well. And, uh, you know, it's getting serious for you whenever, you whenever you take your socks off to actually operate. I was going to be there for a while. This was Runes, uh, SM5COP, a little bit farther north from where we were. Um, I asked to operate his station as well, and he was like, yes, but I have to go find the microphone. <laughs> he did, and there it was, because he was a CW of only. And, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, he turned everything on, and I had a blast, and I had about maybe 500 contacts in the logbook before we even got to our final destination. I was pretty happy about that. You might know this guy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this guy, okay, so I, I like to at least put out there that I've you know, operated from you know, 10 other DXC entities, and that's great. This guy, 207 call signs that this guy actually has. Um, this is Marty Lane. Um, he is one, one of the most accomplished DXers in the entire world, and he is in, um, he, he is in Finland. Uh, we, had a, we had a chance to actually meet him. He actually took us around for the entire day, showed us a really a lot of really cool stuff, um, showed us all, I think, five of his stations. 
which each of them were just uh, just in, in, impressive on their own. And um, I, I wanted to ask, could I operate either one of them? I, I, I just literally could not bring myself to it. So no, I did not operate Randy is. Got to spend the entire way to uh, deal with him. He, he, just a really cool guy. And uh, if you ever get a chance to, I would definitely do it. He was just really down to earth, down to earth guy. The camera that's around his neck, I, I don't know if it was Nokia or not, but um, I'm not gonna say anything. So this was a spower. This this is our okay. Uh, okay, so this was this was our final dest destination, and this was um, where we want to go. This was not for a contest. The other, the other two were this this was not. We were going to go there for like a, a week, a week and a week and a half, and actually operate. And this was obviously different than the ones that I've actually been to. This was not in the Caribbean. This was 500 miles away from the North Pole. This was the station that we actually rented. Very nice, very cozy. Uh, there was a bait that was right behind there. Uh, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was extremely comfortable. It was, it was. Um, again, uh, a hundred foot tower. Thought it was kind of short, but that's all they had. That was a JK antenna on top with a rotating 40 meter dipole. And um, let's see if this actually works. Yeah. So all this, this was like the anchor points for multiple, multiple wires that they actually had. Uh, this trunk up, and it was a really awesome uh, station. That station is actually on on the air quite regularly. So if you need Svalbard, it's not that hard to actually get. In fact, I <laughs> I finished my my shift. There was there was another guy coming on. I put him on the radio. I went back to my hotel, logged into my flex at home, and made the contact back with him. So that's how I got here. This was the uh, average station that we'd run. It was a uh, K3 with a K5500 over there to the left. Some had one monitor, some had two. Um, no, nothing really impressive. It was just um, it was just bare bones, and it, and it was what we, we needed. And um, it just it just worked. But we paid attention to propagation and you know how that was going to work. And um, yeah, so that was that was a really good trip. Um, the very last one, Ghana, who worked the 9 X-ray station. The others were rough. This was rougher. <laughs> Reason why I got this picture up here, obviously that's not me, no, um, is that they did something on the Ghana expedition that was kind of last minute, but it worked. The remote operating is now become kind of at least more of a possibility of what they're doing. They took a Starlink satellite um, connection out there, and that's what they used. So me and another individual, uh, Warren Kitty for Zed, we actually, um, you know, remoted in from our home QTH into theirs and operated FT8, and it was from our home stations. It was for, it was from where we were, where we had internet connection, and we were able to do a remote desktop connection. Um, it, it, it worked. I mean, we had a little bit of issue, sure, but it was one. It was it was, it was nothing that we're not going to be able to work through come the next time. The thing about it is, is that the expedition itself made 17,000 cues. Um, but between Warren and, and, and I, we made 1,140 cues. And by that, I mean Warren made 1,139 cues. I made one, so that adds up to 1,140. Anyways, that was obviously I didn't get a chance to go. I had things to come up for. I couldn't really make it, but this was like literally the next best thing I was going to be able to, to do. And I think that you're going to find that being the uh, obviously the transmitters was 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 on the place. But I think you're going to find more of this um, happening, whether it's local where they are, like boat to the island, or something that you're going to be able to do remotely. Um, it it was just very efficient in how it actually worked. So um, regardless how you how you how you feel about it. It worked. We were able to expand the uh, technology to boundaries, and um, at least on my side, it was fun to be able to actually be able to participate in the, that, even though I couldn't actually go. Um, somebody asked me, "Well, what does it look like from the opposite side of FT8 pileup?" No, not necessarily a pileup. This is it. This is a little bit different than what your FT8 station looks like, isn't it? So whenever we decode people calling us, the call sign will pop up right over here. Okay? And then we click on those calls, and it goes down here to the queue. And that's where it stays. After, after that, it's an automatic process, completely automatic process. It goes from the queue to the in-progress, it makes the contact, and it's gone. Now, at times, we can change the number of slots. So you know how I go over there to the left, below 1,000. 
where there's like one stream, two stream, or, or, or here it was like to five. If we're having a weak signal going somewhere, we can minimize that to say, you know, we can, you know, we, we need to actually get out, so we kind of minimize, uh, minimize that to two. But for uh, but for, for just common, if, if they can hear you, you can hear them, we just left it at five. Somebody also asked me, well, what can you do to break through the pileup? I can teach you that on sideband. I might be able to give you some tips on CW. This is tough. This is really, really tough because, yeah, I mean, do you, do you only click on the ones that's got like a strong signal? Do you only click on the ones that has a weak signal? It, it, there's really no rhyme or reason, or if it is, I've not been taught that. I will say that there is a trick to this, is if I know you and I recognize the call sign, I might click on it and I might send you a text. Hey, John, got you, buddy. Because he doesn't know it's me. He doesn't know it's me. So, yeah, that was something that I actually did for uh, John at TOTOL. Um, it was, um, I think it was like late at night. I don't know if I was necessarily doing anything. He was actually popping up. I actually kicked all the other guys out and put his call sign in, and then he made the contact, and then nobody else called anymore. So, yeah, it was a good contact, though. But, yeah, it, it, ways of getting around that. Am I missing something, um, Warren, or is that pretty much it? From, from the DX side? Yeah, yeah. My, my screen looked a little different. Hang on a second, Warren. I can't hear you on the internet. Yeah, uh, that was the first time I'd been on the, the Fox side. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the screen looked like what you see up on the, on the projector right now. But uh, in the middle, there's a, a column that says Q, if you point that out, Nathan. There's only one call in it right now. Um, when I was on for about five hours, 10 meters just lit up. And as all I could do to keep from wearing out the mouse, of course, all I was doing is clicking. It's not like it's hard. But I was keeping the cue uh, on the right, which is the, the, the right column where the calls are actually going out, as full as I could. And it was working five stations at a time. And uh, each cycle, it would finish five. So it just went over and over and over. But I could load up as much as I could, but it, uh, it would probably stop at like maybe 10 or 15 stations and it wouldn't let you add any more. But that would only take a, about three cycles around and then I, I'd have to do it again. It was, it was weird, so many people, that all they were doing was calling. But what I did notice was uh, people that were getting in over the top of others were coming in at the higher edge of the passband. So they were looking around 2,000 to 3,000. And if you look on your pan adapter display when you're working these big pileups, you'll see a heavy loading down to 1,000 hertz. You, you want to be able to move your transmit up to the higher side and pick a clean spot the next time you transmit. Try to be in a hole, and then you might be heard on the very next cycle. And that's what was happening. So uh, that's all I really noticed. But it was it was wild seeing so many stations come in the queue so, uh, where it was just click, 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 and it would work them as fast as they would go. Um, any questions about? Good deal, good deal. Else? Yeah. yeah, so I did, I did 839 queues in four hours uh, on 10 meters that one set stint. Cool. The one thing I never kept up was uh, the pan adapter because for me it didn't matter. Either either they came up and I was able to click on them or it just didn't. And so that necessarily didn't matter to me. So I never actually kept that up. And so that's that's what it looked like and uh, that's what we uh, did. And you know, great. Yeah, it was it was it was still clicking and it was FT8 and I and I really had my own own opinion about that maybe six months to a year ago. Um, but I think this has kind of changed it that way. I was able to see what the propagation was. I was able to, because it's, it's, it's in a numerical value and you saw the actual changes. Um, so that was what I really um, enjoyed about doing the FT8, even though I wasn't necessarily on the ground there. Uh, I was at least able to participate. So just to recap, identify where you're going, uh, get your permits, identify your equipment, uh, what's the best way to transport, good operating practices and managing pilots. That's, that's gonna be the one thing that's gonna spend a whole, the majority of the time on it. Um, and uh, just don't give the operator a reason to spin the dial and to confirm your QSOs via LOTW and direct if possible. I am not going to elaborate on this. Um, if you have any, any, any uh, questions about 
true that selling at all, I would definitely direct you to Neil Foster. He is the absolute expert about that, and so I'm not going to even 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 touch this subject. Uh, he's he has he has wealth of knowledge about that, so I would definitely direct you over to him. If you have any questions, um, especially about cards, I mean, it's just it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And his book is as well. In fact, I thought I was going to bring him a rare card today, and he has already got it. So. <laughs> Um, and just have fun. Have fun. If, 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 if you're not having fun, then you know, mail me all your equipment. I'll be able to sure to take care of that for you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Scott. Do you have opinions about uh, OQRS and Club Log? Well, I have a lot of opinions about a lot of things, so nobody really wants to hear them, though. Um, no, so OQRS, yes, that, that is a very valuable tool that Club Log does offer to where you're able to go on, uh, to usually make a small donation, and you get anything from a variety to a bureau card, to a direct card, to a direct plus express LOTW, which is what we were doing for uh, this one. Um, I think it's, it's, it's extremely helpful, for ex ex especially when there's no chance of getting um, an LOTW confirmation. You can at least order your card, and I have to even send one of yours out. You save for shipping, and yada, yada, yada. So, um, I think it's a great tool. Um, yeah, is, it, is it for everybody? Obviously not. Um, but as far as on the expedition side, um, it is extremely helpful whenever it comes to QSL. Lemur. I had just a point to make uh, that picture you saw of Carousel, PJ2T, I think it was. That's where we send the kids on the youth DX adventure that we fund out of uh, the ESA. Uh, money that we collect during Ham Jam. So that's one of the big events that our club does. And that's a very good station to even learn at. You, know, you can work some really massive pileups. They claim to have the most contacts out of that one station than any other station in the, in the entire world. I don't know that I can verify that, but I believe it. I do. And the idea is that the kids get to be the DX and they get to be the end of the pileup, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I, you know, any, any time that I hear people from, from that station at all, I try to make the contact with them because I know how exciting it is over on, over, over, over on the other side, and uh, especially in that one particular you know, spot. So, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? All right, well, I thank you for your time. I know I went over a little bit, but uh, thank you uh, for giving me the time to make the presentation.